Hello, this is Jennifer McGuire, and as always, I'm thankful you're here. Today I have two fold-out card designs for you that don't require any specialty dies. In fact, the first one doesn't require any dies at all. They are very different in styles to show that you can do this technique with whatever supplies you have on hand. Here's a closer look at the first card. You can see it's an inky scene when you open it up. Very fun to do. Then the second card is very simple, and it does use a coordinating die. The first one doesn't. I wanted to be able to show both ways so you can use what you have. Let's get started with the first card that has that inky sky. For this, I'm using Tim Holtz Stamp Timber Release with Simon Says Stamp. You get both this large cling stamp set and the mask together. Now these sell out very quickly every year, so check it out if you are interested but you could use whatever stamps you have. And I feel like the Tim Holtz style stamps work really well with this particular technique. I'm starting with a piece of very heavy weight white cardstock here. You could even use watercolor paper. Use whatever you have. This is nine and a half inches wide by five and a half inches tall. This is wider than we need, but it gives me some room to tape it down as we get it inky. I'm drawing a line halfway along that is at four and three quarter inches. I'm using a pencil so I can erase it later. I'm also drawing a lines at half inch from each end. So I do little half inch marks and draw a pencil line there too. I'll end up cutting off that extra later on, but it's really helpful for the technique that we're doing. Okay, so we have nine and a half inches wide and we have three pencil lines along that. Okay, so now it's time to do some stamping. I have my Misty stamping tool. You could use any stamp positioner or even an acrylic block. Now I'm positioning the Santa image to the right of our background. I wanna make sure that it's to the right of that center pencil line. In fact, it's between the two right pencil lines. This will ensure that it's on the front of our card. You'll see that as we go. I use my anti-static powder tool and now I'm using Versamark ink, which is a clear sticky ink. I'll stamp that and I'll actually double stamp it since my ink pad's getting dry. I will then add Hero Arts white embossing powder, but absolutely any white embossing powder will work. After I've added that, I'll heat set it until it's completely embossed. It'll be hard to see since it's white on white, but it'll work great for this technique. After I've heat embossed that, it's time to put this back into our stamping tool and do some more images. I really like this tree line image that's included in the stamp set, and I'm starting by stamping it in the bottom right corner. Again, I use my anti-static powder tool. I really recommend doing that. We want a really clean heat embossed image so that we can do our inking technique over it. So I stamp that with Versamark ink, adding white embossing powder and heat setting it once again. So you can do any scene you want on this card. You'll see the area that I kind of focus on doing my heat embossing on. But any kind of white heat embossed scene would work here. Now I've added a cloud from the same stamp set, use my anti-static powder tool, stamp this with Versamark ink, and added my white embossing powder and heat set it. Now the next image I want to add is right along the center where that pencil line is, right down the center. So I'm going to erase some of that. I think it's best to erase that pencil line before you do any stamping on it so you can get crisp results. So I'm lining up this tree image so it's really low, so I have some low trees along the bottom center. So I continued to add another tree to this, white heat embossed, and also a cloud towards the left. I'll kind of tilt it in the light here in the camera so you can kind of see it, but it'll all become obvious once we add some ink on top. So basically, on this piece, I'm creating a white heat embossed scene, and when we add the ink, it will really show. After I've created the heat embossed scene, we can use an eraser to erase that center pencil line. I like to erase everything before we add any inking on top. Now for the fun part, it's time to add some ink. I'm using my Tim Holtz Distress Ink and an ink blending tool with a domed foam. I am applying Distress Ink over the white embossing and not taking any effort at all to blend. You don't need to for this technique. I first put down Chip Sapphire towards the bottom and Blueprint Sketch towards the middle and then Seedless Preserves towards the top. You can use any Distress Ink or Distress Oxide Ink that you may have. 
Don't worry about blending at all because we're adding more to the top of this. It's just about adding some color to that white cardstock to give us kind of a start for this dark night sky. Okay, after I've done that, I'll wipe the excess ink off of the white embossing and the white embossing resisted it, so it's nice and bright still. Next, I'm going to use some different sprays to create a kind of painted back and forth background. If you are intimidated by sprays or want a new look for them, this is definitely a technique to try as it is super simple and gives really fun looks. You could use a variety of sprays for this, but today I'm focusing on two from Tim Holtz. I'm using his Distress Oxide Sprays and his Distress Mica Stain Sprays. On the left here, I have some Distress Oxide Sprays. These are beautiful because they have like some dye and some pigment in it, so they kind of sit on top of the paper and absorb in. Really fun for layering. If you've never used oxide sprays, I'll link to a video at the top right where you can learn a lot more about them. I'm also using the Tim Holtz Distress Mica Stain Sprays, which are newer. I've also done a video on this and I'll link to it on the top right. This has a pearlescent shine in it that is bonded kind of to the colorant. So wherever the color moves, the shine goes and it is beautiful. Now these are great to spray and create a sprayed background, but today I wanted to do a quick back and forth painting just so I can feel like a watercolor artist, even though I am not, and get a really neat effect. So what I'm doing today is I'm spraying into little cups. I have these little cups that um, I've had in my craft room forever, and I wash them out afterwards and reuse them. In each little cup, I'm spraying a different oxide spray or mica stain spray. So again, the oxide looks like this. It looks a little more opaque, whereas the mica stain sprays have a pearly shine to them. And when you use them together, you get a beautiful look. Okay, so now that I have all of these in little cups, I'm going to lay them out. The ones on the left up there are the mica stain sprays. The two on the right, the blue ones, are the oxides. And I'm putting a little bit of water in each of these just to water them down. Next, we have our background. Remember how I had a little half inch extra on each side? That's so I could tape it down. And then when I remove the tape, I can cut that off and have a nice clean look. So I tape that onto my desk on the two sides. I have a cup of water, a brush, and I have my spray bottle, which is the Tim Holtz Distress Sprayer, just has water in it. I'm misting my background just a little bit with the water just to get it ready to go. Then I'm taking my brush and dipping it into one of the different products, and then I'll go back and forth. I'm starting with kind of the darker colors towards the bottom, and then I will build my way up. Now, I already put color down. Remember how we put Distress Ink down? So I don't have to put much on top. If I would have started with white cardstock and without the Distress Ink blended on there, I would have gotten a softer background, which is totally fine. And I'll show you that result in a little bit. But here I'm just putting down some color, mixing together or overlapping the mica stain spray and the oxide. Now, when you see this goes down, you'll see the shimmer here with this. But then when I put down the oxide, you'll see how it kind of is heavier when it goes on. It kind of sits on top of the paper a bit more. Now, this is such an easy way to do this. And you don't have to do as much back and forth as I do. I tend to overthink things and overdo them. So don't feel you need to apply as much as I'm doing. And you can really use whatever colors you have of sprays for this. Now, the two blues that I'm using of the oxide spray are very similar to each other. I could have added in a bit more contrast by maybe using seedless preserves of the oxide or wilted violet. But I really kind of wanted to do kind of a blended look and let some of the mica stain spray stand out a bit more. So wherever we're putting the mica stain spray, it will have a pearly shine to it that is just gorgeous in real life. It's not the same as mixing like Perfect Pearl into a uh, colored watercolor because the um, color is actually bonded to the pearlescent shine in it. So if you put a lot of it in one spot, it'll be that color with shine, not uh, just like a white shine sitting on top of the paper. It's kind of hard to describe, but it really is a beautiful way to add color to your uh, backgrounds, especially in this easy technique of going back and forth. 
So once I was done, I just dried it. I'm not heat setting, I'm just kind of drying it by waving my heat gun really high up from the surface and just letting it dry a bit. I then can add more if I want to. When you add more onto the dried background, it'll layer, it'll go on top as you see happening here. If you add more onto a wet background, it kind of blends more and it'll keep moving. So by letting it dry a bit, I can add more on top and put a little more of that blue oxide to kind of pop there over on the sides. So you can do whatever you want with this. You could splatter this with water. You could splatter white paint on it, anything. But I'm going to leave it as is here so that I can enjoy the colors and that beautiful mica shine. If you have Distress Ink Sprays, the non-oxide version, you could use those here also. And look at that beautiful look. I love those bright blue spots and then the pearlescent shine. I'll hold it up to the camera so you can see all that. It is absolutely gorgeous in real life and it didn't take much effort. I can even do this and I'm not good with paint and a brush. When it's completely dry, we can cut off the extra half inch that we left on each side so we could tape it down and look at the clean result we get. So the overall size now is eight and a half inches wide by five and a half inches tall. Now I'm putting this into my scoreboard. I'm gonna flip it over so it's upside down. I'm scoring right down the middle at four and a quarter inches. Then I'm also scoring at two and an eighth of an inch. This will create that fun fold. So I'm scoring along. Now I wanna stop here and pause it. I did this wrong and I want you to do it different. When you score this, I want you to score all the way up to Santa's sleigh and stop and then score again above Santa's sleigh. So you don't score through Santa. So I'm kind of pressing out that part of the scoring that I did there with Santa. It's okay if you do, it works for me, but you want your score line above and below Santa at the two and an eighth inch mark. You'll see me do that later too. Okay, so I reinforced the middle score line, but not the other. We're going to do some cutting here. I am going to cut Santa's sleigh to the left of the score line, to that area, but not by his reindeer over on the right of that score line. So I'm using a craft knife to do this. I am terrible with a craft knife, but I promise it's not too bad because it's not that big of an image and we're only doing this one. If you had a coordinating die, you could do partial die cutting here, which I'll show you later, but I do not have a coordinating die for this image. So I'm just using my craft knife and cutting around the edge. I am not suggesting any technique for this because I'm not good with cutting with a craft knife. Maybe some of you have tips. I every once in a while like to stop and use my paper sander on the back to kind of smooth it out. But this doesn't have to be perfect. You're just cutting around the image. I did leave a bit of a trim around it as you would get if you had a coordinating die. I feel like that helps this kind of stand out in the final design, which you'll see later. So I've cut all the way around up to the score line above the Santa and below the Santa. So you can see just that half of the image is cut. Now I'm gonna reinforce that score line. See how I scored up to Santa and I stop? Then I'm scoring uh, below Santa there and stopping at the end. So this is really how I should have scored it earlier, but it's okay, it works out good. So now I'm going to fold around Santa and check out this fun fold that you get. Again, you could do partial die cutting if you have a coordinating die for this image, and I'll show you that in the next card. So this is just a fun way to create kind of an interactive card. Now, since I'm not great with a craft knife and my knife is a little dull, I have some rough edges, so I just use my paper sander to sand off the edges. Next, I'm cutting two pieces of white cardstock that are slightly smaller than two inches by five and a half inches. This is to get glued to the back of this because I got ink on the back. You could leave it as is, it's totally up to you, but I wanted to cover that. So I'm gluing one right along this fold and then the other would get glued right up against or right on top of that Santa opening. But I do not want to glue Santa down there. So I'm just putting the glue around the Santa opening and then adding that piece there. So again, this is simply to cover up any of the inking that I have on the back. You can totally skip this if you want to. This also is helpful if you have any warping. I didn't have any on my particular card because I used heavyweight cardstock, but if you have any warping, adding pieces to the back also helps to kind of flatten it over time. 
I almost forgot to use the masks that come with the stamp set. I thought I'd do something a little subtle up on the top left corner here. So I'm holding the solid mask in place and I'm using Herewart's Unicorn White Pigment Ink to apply a little bit of like a white halo around this. After doing that, I thought it'd be good if the circle area was a bit darker, so I just added a little bit of Seedless Preserves uh, Distress Ink, just right into that opening, which I kind of overlapped with the white I put down, so I went and I put a little more of that white halo around it just to kind of reinforce that edge. Then we can come in with the other mask, and I just added that on top and applied some white ink over those openings too. Now that this half of the card is pretty much done, let's do the other half that folds together to meet. This is eight and a half by five and a half inches, and I'm scoring at four and a quarter and two and an eighth. So it ends up being just like the piece we just did. So again, this is eight and a half inches by five and a half inches. I will fold right down the center at that center score line and then fold the other score line back onto itself. So you have this kind of little Z fold here on this part of the card also. You can see how these two pieces will fit together in the end. But when I do this, notice there's a little gap there in the center. If that happens to you, no big deal. All you need to do is cut a little bit off the edge of your inked piece. So I'm gonna grab my trimmer here and just cut a very little bit off, less than an eighth of an inch. And then when I go to put them back together, it, you should see that that gap is closed. So we have a really fun fold card. Notice that the white only shows on the left half of the piece, because we're gonna glue that other piece together. So we only need to do any kind of stamping on the left half of this. Now I'm just gonna try to continue the scene onto this, so that when the card is opened, it looks like a kind of a continuous scene. It really is up to you how you do this. You don't need to spend much time doing this. You could even skip this part of the stamping. But I wanted like that little crease there in the middle to kind of continue. So I'm positioning my little tree down there in the bottom left. And I'm using a very light ink for this. I didn't want this to distract from what's going on on the inside. This is an old Hero Arts Soft Sky ink. It's very, very light, which I like. But in this case, I want it to be a little bit darker, so I double or triple stamped it. And there you can see how it just kind of continues the scene but doesn't distract too much. I added a few extra higher trees over on the left edge and also a cloud up on the top left edge. Not too much again, keeping this part simple. I did think it would be fun to add a few stars here and there in the background. And for this, I'm using the Simonses Stamp Magical To Me stamp set. Look at all of the little stars in that. I wanted some of these stars to show when the card was closed. So this is what I did. I put in my white panel. Then I folded this part of the Santa panel and put that right on top. That way I know that that's what the front of my card is gonna look like. The left half of this here is what the front of my card will look like when it's closed. So around Santa, I've placed some of those little star images and I'm stamping those again with the same light blue ink. You definitely do not need to use a stamping tool for this. You could use an acrylic block. However, I've just gotten in the habit of using the Misty, so that's why I used it for this too. I then continued and added a few stars towards the inside panel too, so that when you open it up, you'll see them there. Now because I had stars on the front, I thought I should add a few stars to our inked background. I decided to do them in white pigment ink. So this will be very, very soft. I felt like we had enough going on on this inside scene, so I didn't want it to be much. Just a little bit of white pigment ink here and there to add those little stars. And then the last step for the inked portion is to stamp the little trail behind Santa's sleigh. And I stamped this with a dark purple ink from Gina K. So all of our stamping is done except for the sentiment. I want the sentiment to be seen whether the card is opened or closed, so I'm putting it on the far left of our white panel, making sure it's down low enough so Santa's sleigh doesn't cover it when it's closed. And this sentiment is from the same Tim Holtz stamp set. Now we can glue our panels together. I'm putting glue on the back of the large inked panel. You wanna use something strong here so it doesn't come undone. And I'm just fitting it inside of the white panel. I can move that a little bit until the placement is just right and close our card to make sure it all lines up. 
I did add a few Trinity stamps, Oh My Stars, silver iridescent stars here and there. They don't have bulk to them, so I could put some on the inside and not worry about creating any little indentations on the card when it's closed. But look at how they capture the light nicely. This card was so much fun to make. The coolest thing about it too is that it stands up on display really nicely so you can see the whole scene. Now you'll notice that kind of white open area there. That's where I would write my personal message also. So when this is closed, it is four and a quarter by five and a half inches, so I can put it into a regular A2 envelope. Now this doesn't have much bulk to it either, so it should not require any extra postage. Now here is a closer look to the inking part. If you have any sprays that you feel a little intimidated by or haven't really used yet, try this. This was so easy to just brush back and forth and it creates a great result. So give that a try. Even if you're great with sprays, it's fun to try something new. Now this is where I just used the sprays on a white background where I didn't put color behind it first. And look how bright that is. Would be fun to do like an ocean this way or even just a light sky background. So keep in mind you don't have to put down color first and you can get great results. Super fast to do. Okay, so now that we've done a pretty complicated inky card, let's do a simpler card where I use partial die cutting to make it much easier. So here's a look at the completed card first, and you can see how this opens up to reveal a bunch of ornaments and plenty of room to write a personal message inside. And it stands up nicely on display. Okay, for this we need two pieces of white cardstock that are five and a half inches tall and eight and a half inches wide. You could use colored cardstock if you prefer. One of these we will score twice at two and an eighth of an inch and at four and a quarter inches. We can then fold along these score lines to create kind of that Z fold card. This will be the left part of our card, so we're going to set this aside and come back to it later. It's easier to work on the right side first. Okay, so that other piece of cardstock will be for the right side. This one we're just scoring halfway down the middle, so that's at four and a quarter inches. So basically, this is a side fold note card. Okay, now for the sentiment. The sentiment on this one, I wanted big and bold, so I'm using the new Concord and Ninth Big on Christmas stamp set and the coordinating die. I decided to use the Love and Joy. I thought that would fit nicely in the middle. But you could use any large image you want, stamped, whatever, and I'm using the coordinating stencil. So I put my second piece of white cardstock into my stamping tool. This is the one with the score line down the middle. And over on the right-hand portion, I'm stamping the Love and Joy image with black pigment ink. I'll double stamp that to make sure that I get good coverage. And then I will add clear embossing powder and heat set this. So this image is kind of centered up in that right section of this white piece. Now I'll take this and put it into our scoring tool upside down here. And I am going to score at two and an eighth of an inch, but only around Love and Joy. So I'm scoring right up to the word joy. Then I will continue down here to the word love. So my score line is above and below the love and joy words. Now it's time to do some partial die cutting. I'm gonna show you a couple ways to do it. You just need to take your coordinating die and put it around your image. Now there are two ways to do partial die cutting. One thing you can do is have it hanging out of your cutting plates. So you just put your cutting plates so that right edge is flush there. Then you put your cardstock and die onto that and you have whatever you want to cut, the partial die cut, to be to the left of your cutting edge plates. So everything to the left of the cutting plate edge will die cut. Anything hanging out from the plates won't. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is this way, which I prefer, and that is to just have the top cutting plate on top of the part you want to cut. Anything under that top cutting plate will cut. Anything hanging out won't cut. So those are just two different ways to do partial die cutting. This one works really well for me. I just hold it in place and run it through and only half of that will cut, which is going to help us out in this technique since we don't have to use the craft knife to cut around that area like we did on our last example. Now I'm folding along the score lines that we have and there is the right half of our card. So fast and easy to do with that partial die cutting. And you can do this with any large stamp and coordinating die. 
Now I'm gluing these two pieces together just like we did last time. So I'll slide the right hand piece right into the left hand piece and make sure that those meet in the center nicely. And there we have our fun fold design. This basic design right here can be used in so many ways. You can create scenes, you could do stenciling, anything you want. I decided to go for a clean and simple look and I'm using the Hero Arts Ornaments stamp set. Now this holiday ornament stamp set on the left does have coordinating dies, but I'm not using those today. Instead I'm using the layering ornament stencil and the layering ornaments and trimming stencil. These stencils can be used by themselves to create layered inked ornaments or you can use them along with the stamp set. I like when you can mix and match different things, but they're all sold separately. So I thought it'd be best to do the front. I am closing up my card and putting some magnets on there to hold it in place. I like to do the front when I'm creating a scene like this one. I don't want to stamp across the um, fold line there in the middle, the gap. If you do, then it gets tricky when you open it up. So it's easier if you avoid stamping along that gap in the middle. So you can see all of my ornaments are positioned around that gap. I'm using my anti-static powder tool, stamping with the black pigment ink. You can tell with all the layers and the magnets, it doesn't stamp great the first time, but I'll just stamp it again and again until I get a good result. Then I will add my clear embossing powder to it and heat set it. You don't have to heat emboss any of these images. I just chose to do so. Now we can open up the card and add some ornaments to the inside. Now you could get crazy with this and add lots of ornaments and have some overlapping and masking, but I'm keeping mine minimal and making sure that I have an open area to write my personal message on the inside. So after stamping and clear heat embossing all of the ornaments, it's time to add some coloring. Now you could just color them with markers or pencils or whatever. I decided to use the stencils that line up with them. And again, these stencils can be used separate from the stamps too. I like when we have those options. I'm using some Simon Says Stamp Saturated Ink. It's a beautiful color um, of inks and they blend really nicely. And I'm using a little bitty blender brush from Rabbit Hole Designs, but you could use any inks or any inking tool you want. Now I'm not gonna show this whole process because it's basically just putting ink over the openings, but in the end you can get beautiful color combinations and it doesn't take very long. Inking over a stencil is definitely faster for me than coloring. Now I'm using my T ruler and a black pen to draw the strings going up to the top. This was the fastest and easiest way for me to do this. You could also use a silver pen for this if you prefer. I also added some white gel pen detail to the ornaments just to make it pop. And this is with the Arteza white gel pen, which is definitely my new favorite. It really goes down nicely and it's bright white. Okay, so in the end, I did add a few more of those Oh My Stars from Trinity Stamps. I love those because they catch the light really nicely, but don't add bulk. I put them on the inside and the outside, and you can see how this card opens and closes, and there's a great spot there to write your personal message. It closes to a four and a quarter by five and a half inch card without much bulk, and it does stand nicely on display. So this basic card design here could be done in so many different ways with so many different products, so I hope you'll give it a try. And if you're new to sprays or stains, try this brush technique. I thought it worked really well and was very easy. As always, I have most of my supplies linked in the YouTube description below, but there is a visual supply list link at the top that you can click to see all of the supplies, or you can click over to my blog to see them there. On my blog, you can also save videos and cards for future reference if that's helpful. At the end here, I will link to the two other videos that I mentioned earlier in this video. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day, and I'll see you again very, very soon with another video.